Right. <laughs> okay, so broadcast has started. <coughs> Excuse me. A throat clearing time? Yeah, whatever. Um, because you're not familiar with Google Hangouts, there in the upper left-hand corner, okay. there's a little blue thing with the... Looks chat like a window? Chat. Yeah. Yep, I see it. So in the lower, so in the chat, I have just posted the link to the live show. If you want to see what it looks like. Okay. Um, I can see it. I am still waiting for it to show our broadcast. Starting in three minutes. So I can yes, I can put up a message to tell people what's going on. Now, I, why... Oh. <laughs> there it goes. All right, so you have to... Uh, silly me, you have to actually click the play button. <laughs> uh, okay, gonna, so I got the chat window, screen, everything else looks okay. And so, then what are these things? Control room. So we are going out live. Hi, people. How's it going? We're still getting set up. Just to make sure everything's working. I will post a link to the show notes if anybody wants to follow along in the chat room here. Well, they can't see the chat. I will post it to. Um, <laughs> the... I I can I can post it in that section where it says starting in three minutes. All right, I will send it to you. I have it. It's all right. Don't worry. Yeah, that's the uh, edited, editable version, though. So if you send that oh. out, we can really muck around with whatever we get. <laughs> good Here's idea. Yeah. Uneditable, view-only version. Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> Smart idea. Copy. Yeah, I made that mistake once. I sent out show notes on a different show that were the can edit, and people were just deleting stuff and typing in random bits. It was great. <laughs> Great. All right, so. All right. Man, I'm looking at the Canon announcement right now, and it's not nearly as exciting as I thought it would be. This thing. Oh, God, silly goose. I did wrong. All right, so we'll do it this way. Isn't this fun, people? Isn't it fun when you get to watch people setting up? <laughs> All right, so so now there should be, if you're following along on the live stream, which this will actually be recorded and we can put it up on YouTube, but I can edit out all this junk. Woohoo! Um, there is a show notes button on the bottom of the video if you want to click and... Sing along as we go. Looks like we already have a few anonymous viewers. All right. And I am rolling on my end for audio. Okay, I'm not ready yet, but that's good. Age, there it is. All right. Um... I no longer have permission to the document. You turned me off. What? You, it's uh, all right. Well, you can use the same doable link yeah. as, uh, right. as everybody else. I got everybody it. Else. Sorry about that. That's fine. It's fine. Okay. I don't need to edit it while we go. Well, if you want to, I suppose you can. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, what we didn't discuss, we're going to do it just like a regular show. So we're going to we're going to let you lead off, and then we'll get into it. All right. So we're not going to do anything special as if this was a special event. We'll just we'll just let her rip like a regular podcast. All right. Sounds good. Ready to roll? I uh, yeah, I'm ready. All right. Five, four, three, two. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another exciting episode of the SLR Film New Podcast. It's 
to join you today, and for some reason my fader is not working here. Oh man, did I just fail already? It's alright. Alright, one more time with the start. Boy, this production stuff is hard today. <laughs> alright, five, four, three, two. Those of you at home, I have a fader here that allows me to drop the music down and slowly bring in the cue, which is, hello Mitch, how are you doing today? I am I am awesome, DJ. This is really exciting because we're actually doing this live, which we usually do, right? Live, but yeah, well, sort of live with video live oh, streaming to the planet. This is completely different for me. I've I'm not used to this whole video slash podcast thing. So Mitch is completely taking the lead on controlling this system. I am waking up from a late night. I uh, apparently have a touch of the flu going on, which was great. So, Yuck. Yeah, but it allowed me to work on show notes and read a bunch of different camera releases. And with that note, let's go ahead and move on to the news. Time for the news. Time for the news. Time for the news. First up, we've got a lot of announcements. Uh, Samsung just announced the NX500, which is a upgrade, downgrade of the NX1. Basically, they've taken everything out of the NX1, the 28 megapixel sensor, 4K, H.265 recording, as well as some of the other features, and crammed it into this compact body. We're looking at a price range of $799, which is about $700 less than the NX1. On the downside, they're going to be removing a number of features. That means no 4K HDMI output, no headphone output, no mic jack, no electronic viewfinder. Burst mode has been limited by a number of frames, and they have downgraded from 802.11ac to 802.11n, which means you may not be able to send 4K video to a Samsung-compatible television. Mitch, what do you think about the NEX 500? Uh, I, I really love listening to things like downgrade, downgrade, downgrade. Isn't that cool? It goes right along with the price downgrade. Well, that's good. <laughs> and I, I think the reason people are still excited about this, even though you're missing the audio inputs and all of those other features, is that the NEX 500 does still allow H.265 recording, and it's 800 bucks. so... That puts it into a very affordable price range for people looking to move into 4K recording. And it's interchangeable lens, so... 4K is the big buzzword. We keep talking about it, but like I say, I'm not sure that many people are doing it. Yeah, and then the 28 megapixel sensor in here, this will suffer from the same issues as other people have complained about with the NX1 where the H.265 video codec is hard to handle. Um, otherwise, it's nothing extremely exciting. If you're looking for a full camera that shoots 4K and you want it in a little bit more convenient Kodak, the H.264, you might also want to look at Panasonic's uh, point-and-shoot options because they do have that, I believe it's the FZ1000 or possibly the 100. I can't remember how many zeros are in that number. But uh, that shoots 4K <laughs> and has a 400 to 24 zoom range equivalent on it as well as I believe that's f2.8 to f4 so that's a price same price as this I don't know man I'm I'm looking at this NAX 500 now and I was excited when I first read it read about it but now that I'm reading all the things missing who wants to go back to the days with no audio recorded in your camera that's not really a fun thing it makes it makes it very interesting for sync, of course, for audio sync later on. Uh, it slays me, by the way. I have a good friend. His name's Michael Artsis, and we had this argument the other day about audio, and he's like, I manually sync every bit of audio that I ever put on, whether I'm using Final Cut or Premiere Pro or whatever. And I'm like, why in the world do you still manually will align your things as well. There's a clap, you know, there's a clap in the video and there's a clap in the audio and it's very simple to do. And I'm like, why bother? It's just crazy. It takes and so if, much work. And if you can't record any audio on your video, then even it's it's like, I, I don't understand that. 
Well, you do have things like uh, pluralize, and I have used that in the past, where you do have a little tiny microphone built into the camera, and I believe the NEX 500 does have that. So okay. you can get sort of like rough audio from the area that you're working in, and that way if you have Pluralize installed, you can basically drop the audio clip that you recorded with your sound device and your camera audio in there, and it'll sync up the clips manually for you so that you don't have to do it in your timeline. And that saves a little bit of time and makes it a little bit nicer, but honestly... I know people complain about some of the audio recording capabilities of these cameras, but for the most part, if you hook it up correctly and you have an adapter, say a Juice Links box or a uh, Beach Text box, they give you good enough audio that you're ready to roll out of the shoot. You, by the time you put a sound bed on there and everything, it's so much easier to have your clips ready to go when you pull them out of your camera than it is yep. to try and like sort stuff. And organization, man. Oh, if you have somebody who isn't keeping up with the clip number on your audio clips, then you have to go listen to each scene to make sure you know which scene you're on and sync that with the video clip. So now you're unorganized. Maybe you just end up with a folder full of audio, and you're you're spending hours going through those, picking out the audio that goes with each of the video clips. Not much fun, then, is it? No, like, if you it's like going old, back but... time, yeah. You're going yeah. back to the film days. Uh, <laughs> you know, that was fun because that was the only way it could be done back then, but now that we have modern conveniences, record audio directly into your camera, man. That's <laughs> hey, much easier. Yeah. I did All see right. a news story, uh, by the way, as an oh, by the way, that uh, Kodak has decided that they're, they're going to allow, uh, they're going to keep making film stock for some of the big major Hollywood people, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, that, they uh, actually worked out a deal with six of the major uh, film companies to continue to support Kodak in their filmmaking process. And uh, a lot of the people like Quentin Tarantino and some of the other sort of used to be indie, not really indie anymore filmmakers really still love the idea of shooting on film. And they've pushed really hard for that. So I think we're going to continue to see film stock as a option for another 10 or 15 years, if not longer, just because of the nostalgia factor. It's kind of like the retro bicycle movement that's going on right now. You know how people are going back to those bikes that don't have gears and only yeah. have like one brake on them? Yeah, I, I've seen that too. Crazy for, people. For filmmakers, if you've ever worked on film, pro, uh, an actual film project, it sucks. It's yeah. expensive film develop. I've only ever had to do once. And we bought a bunch of – they used to sell stock where you could buy whatever was left over in the container after they were done shooting because when they stopped recording for the day, they would just throw the reel into a bag and then send it off. And Kodak would cut off whatever they didn't film on and then develop that, and then they would sell you that extra stock for really cheap. Right. So we had a bunch of those canisters filmed with those, and then, man, I think we spent probably – three or four grand on film stock and then another five or six grand just developing the stock to get it into something that we could actually work on and edit and that's the initial cost just for the film not the cameras and stuff I mean we were lucky because at the time you could just go borrow a film camera from somebody because it was kind of when film was tailing, tailing off but man I would not go back to that at all and I know that was a really big sidetrack, and I apologize about that. But for those of you, by the way, who are watching on the live stream, there is a question and answer box, or there's a question box. The answers come through us down at the bottom of the page. So if you want to ask some questions, I have that window open ready to throw those at DJ and I. All right, moving on down the line here. The next camera announcement is the Olympus EM5 Mark II. Uh, this is a very interesting Micro Four Thirds offering from Olympus with a price tag of about $1,999. Excuse me, $1,099. So about $1,100. Let's take those 99s out of there. 
Uh, basically, it looks like Olympus is finally getting serious with their video offering. They've uh, added extra formats to the EM5 Mark II, so now you can shoot at 24, 30 frames, 60 frames per second. They've also increased the Kodak availability, so now you can use an AL-I at 70 megabits per second or 60 frames per second shooting at 50 megabits per second. They've also included upgraded 5-axis image stabilization for both video and for photography. So if you're shooting in low light, that's a kind of cool feature. I've got a question mark here, and I was kind of trying to find the answer to this. The Panasonic GH4 uses a 16 megapixel sensor, as does the Olympus EM5. In the past, I believe Panasonic manufactured the sensors technology for Olympus. Do you know if that's still the case with uh, the EM5 Mark II? I have not seen anything about that, but that's a dadgum good question. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine that it's really a different sensor. It seems to be the same sensor. I and was very impressed. Uh, I, I saw the post by John Brawley, who was the guy that had the... Uh, uh, black magic cameras very early on and he's very impressed by this camera. Yeah, I read through. That's a pretty long article. He seemed very excited about it. I wasn't blown away by the video features. It looks like they've kindly kind of just come from behind to right. catching up with everybody. But at 1100 bucks, it's about $400 cheaper than the GH4. If you're not looking for 4K, the in-camera image stabilization looks pretty Pretty sexy. Yeah, the, the samples that in, in camera stabilization that John put in that article were very impressive. There's some other cool features too uh, for the people wanting to use this for stills. Uh, normally uh, with a shutter you're, norm you're limited to about one eight thousandth of a second for your maximum shutter speed. This has an electronic shutter that allows you to go to one sixteen thousandth of a second so maybe not the complete elimination of the need for ND filters, but it's pretty darn close. That's a heck of a fast shutter. That is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I, when I saw that, I highlighted it, because I, I, and then I researched it a little bit more to make sure that that was actually the thing. That seems almost impossible, but I guess they're doing it. Uh, the other cool thing is this has that uh, 40 mix, uh, megapixel multi-exposure mode. Uh, basically what that does is it uses the 5-axis image stabilization system to slightly shift the sensor around to capture each of the colors. You have to mount the camera onto a tripod, and it takes, I believe, eight or nine shots and then combines them together to form this 80-megapixel image. And it's supposed to be really high res. It's supposed to be great for landscape photographers, and I think it's sort of a way to give the Olympus a little bit of its own feature set compared to the GH4 and some of the other Micro Four Thirds cameras out there. What do you think, Mitch? Are you going to buy a Micro Four Thirds camera? <laughs> that would be a first for me if I did. Uh, I haven't yet purchased one because I've got this major investment in EF lenses. So uh, I, I'm fascinated by this camera, and I, I think that's a very interesting feature, the fact that I, I don't know quite how it works because it seems to me that multiple images would might maybe make it more difficult to be sharp but their demo that I saw was was very impressive so well, sharpness I, isn't the, the thing for absolutely everybody but if you're doing a billboard maybe you you need a lot more detail well I spoke with um, uh, Devin a few podcasts back and he explained this pretty well the way he explained it is that by moving the sensor a little bit to the left and to the right and up and down they're able to capture the color from each of those areas multiple times and right. then combine those and add them together to get perfect vivid colors for each of those spots. So it is a little bit about sharpness, but it's also about making sure that they capture the color rendition from each of those spots as good as possible. I might be explaining this completely wrong because I do not understand this tech that well, but... Um, it's a cool thing. I want to play with it. In $1,100, I'm half tempted to pull the trigger on this just because I have so much uh, M43 stuff. <laughs> well, you've got a lot of extra money, so you can send some of it to me, okay? Oh, man. If, <laughs> I don't know about having a lot of extra money, but uh, 
I could probably sell off one lens and pick this up. And it, it makes it kind of tempting. It is right a now, tempting camera. I'm, yeah, and it, one of the things that draws me to the Olympus is actually the classy look. It has that old school kind of rangefinder look to it right. that I really enjoy. I don't really carry my camera around as a image, you know, as a to make me look stylish or cool. So I don't know if I really need something that looks interesting like this, but it's something to consider definitely. Well, now, you need you need some kind of accessory to make you look a little bit more stylish. I know, right? My gray <laughs> hoodie and nothing else of fanciness on me. All right, moving on. Olympus has another weird offering, and this is actually – this one is kind of cool. I, if this is two or 300 bucks, I probably will buy this. Um, they call it the Air Clip, and what this is is basically a micro four-thirds version of the Sony QX1. You remember the Sony QX1? Yeah, the one that clips that, onto the side of your iPhone. Yeah, that weird clip-on, it was basically yeah. like an ultra zoom that goes onto your, your phone, and then your phone is used for your viewfinder. Well, this is a micro four-thirds version of that, and it's the same 16-megapixel sensor that they're including in their new camera line. Same autofocus, 10 frames per second. You don't have the image stabilization, but it does have the electronic shutter, so again, that one sixteen thousandths of a second for your shutter speed. It also has a USB adapter. It runs on a micro... SD card. Wow, they actually fit a memory card into that thing. And then it's got a, a rechargeable battery. And they're talking 3,000 yen, um, and it's supposed to be released in Japan, but I don't know what 3,000 yen translates to. Um, I looked on on Google's uh, dollar translation thing, and it said $25, and that can't be right. So <laughs> no, obviously there's something I'm missing in the in the dollar translation. But uh, they're expecting to release this in Q2 of this year, and it's just a cute, weird thing that I kind of want. What do you think about this, Mitch? Well, uh, the article that you have linked in the show notes says price is 33,800 yen. Oh, that makes way so, more sense. So, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different there. And while I was sick last night, I probably got my yen translation. <laughs> Oh no! Let's see what that. Okay, two hundred and seventy-seven dollars. Okay. That makes so much more sense. Yeah. Man, yeah. If, if they could come in under three hundred dollars for this, I think I would buy one just to like throw a couple of primes in my bag and then throw this in there. You know, then you're not carrying an actual full-size camera. You're just carrying this little jobber and a, a couple of lenses. I I've always thought that the concept is very interesting because then you have the whole ability to sync or to use apps on your phone, right? Yeah. Um, we've all talked about the fact that that would be really cool to have on our DSLR to be able to have some apps like Magic Lantern embedded, uh, which may take forever to ever happen. So this is a, a fascinating concept, and I I like to play around with one too and see what it see how it works. Now, the one thing I didn't see in the specs here is anything about video. So I wonder if this is just for photography and that's it. Um, it, it could have some video, but there was none mentioned and none in the specs list. So this may just be for a sort of ultra-compact point-and-shoot sort of application. Now, on to the big stuff here, and this is where I will uh -huh. rely heavily on Mitch because... 5D, and 5D is the release, Canon has finally come out with the specs and the date for release of the Canon 5DS and 5DSR. What I'm looking at here is a list of specs side by side, and it appears that the major difference between the R and the S is that they have basically added that low-pass filter compensation cancellation to the R. Correct. I guess that gives you one less layer for the light to travel through before it gets to the sensor, so you get Correct. sharper, more crisp images, but Correct. then you're in danger of possibly being affected by more A patterns in fabric and things like that? Correct. Yeah, the, the, the low-pass... This filter has always been added on to every DSLR that's pretty much ever come out, except for the Nikon D800 and D810. Uh, and I'm sure there are several others now that have done it, but 
And once I knew about them, I was always like, huh, why is that? Well, you know, we're always begging for more sharpness in our stills, but uh, there's this filter in there to make it less sharp so that we don't have more A patterns. Uh, now, so, are you pretty excited about 50 megapixel? No, not, I'm not personally. I, I don't shoot that much stuff that I really need to have that many megapixels. However, it would be kind of cool. Uh, um, you know, I shot, for example, I shot some uh, stills of my daughter's color guard, winter guard, this past weekend, and it would be really nice to be able to crop in on some of those images because I was using the 70 to 200, but if you could pretend to have like a, you know, 400 or 600 millimeter lens by being able to crop in really well, uh, really closely, that would be kind of awesome for certain situations. Now, I'm kind of nervous about some of Canon's lens offerings that I have in my collection. They've already kind of hinted at a new line of L-series lenses that are meant to support 50 megapixel. Does that mean that the limit for image quality is actually going to be the lens that we attach to this in our, you know, I run the older version of the uh, 70 to 200 IS, the newer version, maybe it's sharper, but what if it's not sharp enough? Well, it's, that's where you always get into the, the devils in the details. Um, a lot of people will have difficulty, even shooting 4K. We have the same conversation about shooting 4K video is uh, because the resolution is so much higher, do your lenses re resolve that kind of detail and most lenses that were older lenses are not made to resolve that kind of detail. Uh, now that being said most lenses are pretty much sharp enough especially if you're talking about L lenses. Um, I'm sure there will be a, a glut of new articles on the market about which lenses really give you that kind of resolution uh, um, but you know, it, it all depends upon what the look and feel is that you one of your images. If you really, really need super sharp, then you're going to need to get lenses that resolve that kind of detail. Now, I was looking through all of the information on the 5DS and 5DSR, and I didn't see a whole lot of info on the actual video capabilities of these cameras. That's and they because were there isn't quick. much. They were, they were really quick in their uh, video post that you sent me to mention right away, hey, this is A, a Canon sensor, and B, this does not replace the 5D Mark III. Correct. So this is a branch off, and they're basically doing, what, the same thing as they did with the 1D series? It, it's, it's aimed at photographers who need high-resolution images, maybe billboard photographers, uh, landscape artists, architectural photographers. Uh, they're very clear that this is a photography camera. There is no headphone jack like the 5D Mark III has. Uh, there is mention of 30 frames per second, but nobody I've seen yet says that there's 24 frames per second, even as an option. Uh, so this is clearly not a video camera. If you want to shoot video, you're going to want to stick with the 5D Mark III. Now, it seems that uh, Canon has basically released a bunch of higher-resolution cameras. Looking at the T6i, uh, it basically has the upgrade of a 24-megapixel sensor and the AF system from the original Canon 7D. Are we just going to see a more... I actually have a comment in here. I'm laughing at myself. I wrote lame in, in quotation <laughs> marks here. Um, it seems like the, six, the T6i is basically every T-I before it, you know, with a slightly, slightly upgraded sensor or AF. I mean, this is the first time they've changed the AF system in the T-series in, what, five generations, four generations? Because they were using the nine uh, nine uh, AF uh, points on the T2i all the way up to the T5i, and now they're bringing the 7D's old focus system to the T6i. That how long are they going to run that into the ground? Well, it's it's rather interesting. Um, I like the fact that they've finally put in some meaty upgrades in the T6i for those people that are wanting that kind of a camera body. 
However, uh, I think you and I talked about it last week or the week before, the fact that uh, a lot of people are still buying the T3i, 3Ti. I say it wrong every time. The T3i is one of the most popular cameras on the market. And I noted last night as I was looking around, by the way, that Amazon says the T3i is discontinued. Uh, oh, really? I did, I did not see that on B&H's site, uh, but Amazon, Amazon's link for the T3i says discontinued, which, which is an interesting little bit of, of info if people are out there looking for the T3i. Uh, so you know, I, it's, it's good that they've added a bigger uh, sensor on this. Uh, it's, I shouldn't say bigger. It's the same size. It's an APS-C. And in fact, it's the highest megapixel resolution on any uh, of Canon's APS-C cameras. It's it's I, the 7D Mark II is still stuck at 18 megapixels. Is it? I thought it was uh, higher. Hold on a second. Now no, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure the the 7D was still at 18 megapixels. So the 7D says uh, Mark II is a 20 megapixel. So you're correct, okay. Mitch. This is the I, highest one. They, I mean, they did bump it up. 18 yeah. was the uh, original 70. Right. 20 megapixels is the new 70, and 24 is what they're throwing into this uh, T6i. So now, what can it, you tell me about the difference between the T6i and T6s? Uh, that's <laughs> a, a bizarre, uh, interesting difference. I mean, they're the the T6s. The major difference. And I think it's the only difference is the fact that there's a LCD on the top of the camera, which makes it quote unquote a little bit more professional. Uh, do I use the LCD on the top of my 5D Mark III that much? No, I tend to use the LCD on the back of the camera. Uh, so, is it worth an extra hundred bucks for that? Uh, I don't know. I guess it depends upon how often you particularly use the LCD. So, it is a slightly different body because it has the LCD up there, uh, but Feature-wise, everything else is the same. Yeah, I'm looking at the images right now. You're absolutely right. It appears that they just moved the mode dial over to the other side. Yep. Honestly, when I'm doing photography, I actually do use my readout quite a bit on my Canon cameras. Um, I always I fat finger it, and I'll accidentally change the focus mode or change it to burst mode, or I'll be switching back and forth. And those indicators, I don't actually turn on my screen on the back of my camera very often. Uh, so either I'm using the information from the eyepiece or if I'm walking around and changing something, I'm using the LCD screen. So that is kind of nice, and that's actually something I've missed going to Micro Four Thirds is that I have to either look in the viewfinder or uh, use the flip-out screen to figure out what my settings are. And then I have mine customized for video, so then some of my photography features are actually missing from the display because there's audio meters over the top of it and stuff like that, and then it's right. even more confusing. Well, you make a good point. So maybe maybe there are plenty of people out there who will be very excited about that. Last one on the list here, and I actually I don't know if this was really released or if I just found this floating around on the internet somewhere, but I saw EOS M3 mentioned in a few articles. Do you know if this is even a thing? Yes, it, it was announced last night. Uh, I have not yet processed that email. Uh, I'm not sure my readers are all that excited about it, but uh, there is a press release on a brand new M3. Let me see if I can pull that up. Yeah, I'm looking on theverge.com right now to see what they have. It I've, looks... I've got so many emails from last night, it's insane. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they were just coming in left and right. All right, I'm looking at it. It looks like it does have a 24-megapixel APS-C sensor. So they're using the same sensor as the T6i. It has Wi-Fi connectivity, 49 points of hybrid phase detection autofocus. So they're still relying on that uh, mirrorless AF system that they were kind of using in the original EOS M. Um, yeah, what else? <laughs> That's about it, really. Uh, it doesn't look like there's much else exciting. They added a little nub of a grip to the camera itself. Was there an EOS M2? Because I have an EOS M1 sitting over here, but I don't remember even seeing an M2. I don't recall either, to be honest with you. I I thought there was an upgrade to the M1, uh, but 
I don't recall seeing anything about the M2. Huh. Yeah, this... You know, with the Canon EOS M, one of the things I still kind of recommend it for is people who are just early, early adopters of video. They've, they haven't done anything else yet. They're just starting out, and they want to do a little bit of filmmaking and a little bit of photography. The EOS M1, you can get that used for 140 bucks, 130 bucks, and it's an APS-C sensor, and you can buy the... Like it. What's that? I, I'm sorry. I said because nobody liked it. <laughs> well, that's true, but it, it it has the ability to handle a magic lantern, so you can add audio level meters to the screen and a few other features that make it handy for filmmaking. It is really, really cheap. It's easy to adapt lenses to because it's, it has a narrow flange distance, so you can put whatever you want on it. And then the STM lenses that are available are in the $100 range, so you can get an entire kit together for maybe $400, $500 and start filming with this thing. For photography, it sucks. It's <laughs> The AF system is bad. It's hard to use. The refresh on the screen is bad. There's shutter lag. I don't really recommend it at all for photography unless you are taking product shots of something that's stationary and you can just plop the camera down and not have to worry about anything else. But uh, for video, if you're a video shooter, at 140 or 150 bucks, that's a pretty good bargain for an APS-C interchangeable lens camera. I don't know if there's anything else that even competes with that price range. Maybe the T2i, I, I suppose, but even that has held its value in the used market. I believe they're still running 250 to uh, $300. So... If you're a filmmaker and you're just starting out and you want something really, really cheap and you're on a really tight budget, the EOS M1, and it'll probably drop even more in price now that the EOS M3 is out. Now, Mitch, you've been filtering through all of these press releases and news outputs from every single <laughs> vendor. What else is there out there now? Well, I, I, I'm kind of surprised I was... Looking at my email while while you were rambling on. No, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's um, what I do. I, I I thought that I saw an M3 announcement in this big slew of things from Canon, but what's what's really here, surprisingly, is a press release not about the M3, but it says Canon is developing a PowerShot G3X Premium, and it's kind of bizarre. Canon's doing some interesting things. For example, the, the uh, 5DS and DSR aren't due until June, and so yeah, they're, they've they, there's a small little caveat down at the bottom of the press release that says they have not gotten FCC approval yet, and my understanding is that they can't pre-sell those, so you can't even pre-order them yet. Uh, but they they're not they haven't gotten approval yet, so they're not going to release it until June, huh. which is unusual that they would announce something that early. Now, in the past, they have done that. Like for the One DX was announced like six months early. Uh, I remember being really surprised about them doing that because they've always complained about rumor sites saying, you know, well that's killing our sales when somebody announces a rumor of like a new 5D Mark IV, so the 5D Mark III slows down. But back in that day, they announced the 1DX six months before, and so the sales of the 1DS at the time went down the dumper. So they did it to themselves. I was, I was always mad at them about that. Uh, so here is this PowerShot G3X Premium that they're talking briefly about at, they're going to show it at the C plus CP plus camera yeah. and photo imaging show, which is February twelfth to the fifteenth. So they're showing a prototype of this camera there, uh, but they don't really say much about what the excitement is in this little mini press release. They're just telling you that it's they're working on it. The biggest feature is a one inch sensor and a twenty five x optical zoom. Is what they the two big things they really highlight here in this press release. Have you used uh, one of their G-series cameras in a while? I have not. I've never never had one. 
the last one I owned was the G12, I believe. And I had kind of at random picked up one or two of these over the years because one of the things that the G series was known for is that it allowed for uh, raw image capture. And it was one of Canon's few point-and-shoot cameras that did allow for raw image capture. So you could manipulate your image in post when you were done. And that made it a little bit handy. The G12, though, and some of the earlier ones that I've owned, they were pretty laggy as far as shutter goes, and they weren't the snappiest cameras to, to use. I think the FPS on those was maybe 1.4 or 1.5, so if you, if you held down the shutter, your burst rate was pretty awful. You know, you could count along with the shutter speed. You know, that's how slow it was. Right. And all these other point-and-shoot cameras are really uh, from... You know, Panasonic is offering up some really good point-and-shoot cameras. Um, Samsung has some great offerings. And, it, hell, Sony, all their stuff is really good. How, I don't know, Canon, what are you doing, man? The the G series is kind of sitting there stagnant. I haven't seen anything amazing or interesting out of that series in a number of years. Uh, it's basically like a cool-looking body and a flip-out screen, and you haven't really done much else, have they? Well, that's I guess that's why they're teasing with this G three X twelve. Uh, you know, I get all wrapped up with all these numbers, and I don't have it in front of me anymore. G one X Mark two Premium Edition. That's right. Something like um, that. So you know, some very interesting cameras from Canon. I I think it's interesting that the five DS, for example, is. You know, like like you said, a, a sort of an offshoot of the 5D series. I mean, that's obviously an offshoot. I'm stating the obvious, uh, but it's 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 like uh, Northlight. Uh, God, what is Northlight Images uh, from the UK? Yeah, said that they had heard rumors that Canon was going to be doing more targeted bodies, and this is an example of the fact of. You know, it's a it's it's like a high end sensor, high end megapixel for those folks who need it, but they've specifically not put all of the 5D Mark III video capabilities in it. So it's it's a very specialized kind of camera, and it's it's just interesting that they're going down that route as opposed to. I mean, several other things about this camera, for example, the the highest ISO that they really target market here is 6400. Yeah, where they were going kind of li uh, low light capability before that does right. seem disappointing. Well, it's it's again disappointing for those of us who may be filmmakers who want low light stuff. But if you think about people who are doing architectural shooting, they're not doing it at night. Uh, landscape photographers are typically not doing it at night. Studio people who are really wanting this high resolution, very sharp images, they're blasting a ton of light at their models. That's true. And, and so realistically, they're aiming this at a specific group of people. And if you watch the Canon videos that they've just put out this morning, that's they pretty much say that. You know, they don't they don't limit it and say, well, you people who are interested in a camera that does XYZ don't watch. But they're <laughs> they're very subtle in saying that this is targeted at landscape photographers, wedding photographers who do high detail, you know, stuff and and then they tell you, like you mentioned, the fact that if you're interested in video, oh by the way, the 5D Mark III is still there. So they were also uh, very specific about uh, the R mode or the R version. They, they mentioned several times that, hey, you know, this does provide sharper image, but we consider it a specialty camera, not the camera that you should definitely go to if you're looking for uh, high, meg high megapixel images. That seemed exactly. like they were really like segmented off. The same thing that Nikon does with their D810. And it, right. it kind of does actually feel like Canon is just sort of copy and Nikon a little bit on this move right. by saying, like, hey, you know, Nikon's had some success by offering the D800 in multiple versions and the D810 in multiple versions. We should do the same. Well, if you, and, and if you look at it in detail, you see that Canon has also added a 1.3x crop 
and a 1.6x crop, which Nikon had in the D800 and D810. I did not see that. That's yeah. finally being added so that you can use uh, APS-C lenses on your 5D. Um, is it a sensor crop or is it just um, a rescaling? It's a rescaling, I believe. Well, no, it's a sensor crop. Because yeah, I, be I thought the crop. Nikon uh, version was a sensor crop where you yes. could actually go to APS-C setting or to um, or you know whatever scale you set it to, and then you could put an APS-C lens on your full-frame camera. Correct. Okay, so th I wonder if that's what's going on with the Canon then, uh, with Canon's 5DS. That would be interesting to find out. You, We've always, well... I, I take that can I can I put uh, I'm, I'm having a mental block I'm, I wish somebody would answer this question for me can you put uh, an EFS lens on a 5d mark three uh, you, you can put a non-canon crop sensor lens on a canon body because the EFS mount is proprietary to Canon so right. their EFS lenses, only mount on Canon EFS bodies or uh, APS-C bodies. Okay. Um, the APS-C uh, lenses that are made by everybody else use stand uh, Canon's standard EOS EF mount, mount. Right. EF okay. mount. So right. if you have like a Sigma crop sensor lens, like the 30 millimeter f1.4, you can put that onto the 5D Mark III, and you'll just get the dark. Uh, ring around the part of the image that it's not covering. So right. if you were able to actually punch in on the sensor itself, like they do with uh, the GH4 and some of these other camera brands, then you could put a non-branded Canon adaptable APS-C lens onto your 5D Mark III, or not Mark III, DS, right. And, right. and then crop into that and use that lens in the same fashion as you would on an APS-C camera. Well, that's it, cool. At 50 megapixels, if you are able to actually crop into um, APS-C size, then the APS-C size would probably be, I mean, I'm just doing some rough math here off the top of my head, but I, I would think like 28-ish megapixel. So you would still be getting a pretty high-resolution image to work with on there. I might be wrong on that 28 megapixel, folks. Don't, don't right. quote me on that, but... Uh, <laughs> It seems like it should be in about that range because it's um, it's a squared type of deal when you're increasing up and down in the in the size of the sensor that you're using. I I actually saw that number somewhere and and I apologize that I don't know where it is. There are so many things that I still have open, and I appreciate you answering that uh, question about the cropping. But yeah, I mean, for example, I was talking to the staff photographer at the color guard thing that we were at that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And we were he's a Nikon guy and I'm a Canon guy and we were talking about cameras of course and he mentioned that he specifically picked the I think he was using a D three thousand. I've forgotten which one exactly. But he said you know, he's got a seventy to two hundred uh lens that he really likes and he specifically wanted the crop camera so that he could punch in a little bit closer than he could if he was using a full frame camera. So this the, having that capability to be able to switch back and forth on a camera is very impressive. I I would really like to be able to do that at times to boost my effective focal length of my lenses without having to switch a body. I know uh, several photographers that carry around a 7D body as well as their 5D Mark III for that reason. When they want to get a little bit of extra reach out of their 70 to 200, they actually right. plop it right down on the 7D, and then they get the higher burst rate so they can get in further, they get a little bit more reach, plus they get that 8 frames a second burst rate out of it, and then they're you know cooking with diesel or uh, you know however that saying goes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But... Uh, it, and it makes it really good for uh, sports photographers or, or something like you were saying with the color guard where you need to get in there closer and then you also want to have that burst rate where you know something action's happening really fast and you want to capture as much of it as you can and then pick through the images later on. So right. that's exactly. kind of a cool deal. Uh, the one thing they did note in the 5DS announcement is that despite cropping in or changing the uh, amount of of image resolution in the medium and uh, small raw modes, 
you do not get a higher burst rate. You are locked in at five frames per second, but your continuous burst rate uh, stretches out depending on the size of image that you're capturing. So that's kind of unfortunate. I would have liked to see that go up with the smaller amount of data it's capturing, but I guess that's not going to be the thing. Yeah, you dreamer. You you want everything, don't you? Well, man, you know, when I I first branched away from strictly Canon cameras uh, at the beginning of last year, and when I get my hands on stuff like the Sony a7S and the GH4 and some of these other cameras, you're like, man, look at all these extra features that these companies are giving us. I don't need half of them most of the time, but the ones that I do need, it's like, oh, man, look at this. You know, I can punch in on this uh, lens and get uh, you know twice the zoom factor out of it. I can do all these other crazy things. I have a bunch of options for changing my screen layout and the uh, displays that are on there. And then I look at my Canon camera and I'm like, man, most of this is software, not hardware. Your hardware is totally capable of handling all of these same features, but you don't give it to us. Instead, you just give us the same kind of vanilla ice cream of options and everybody else is, you know, throwing in Rocky Road and putting sprinkles on it and stuff like that. You know, it's it's just really frustrating because Canon makes a product I really like and I just want them to meet my needs as well as other people's needs. And sure, you could turn those features off if you don't want to use them. That's great. But give us the option to use them. Uh-huh. Exacto mundo. I, I agree I, with you a million percent and I've complain to them about it every chance I can get. For example, however, they're finally getting there. What's What extra features that we haven't talked about are built in? Guess what? An intervalometer. Oh my <laughs> god. They've finally done it on a quote-unquote pro body. Wow. The, yes. you, know, you no longer have to carry your dongle around with you. Yes, or, it's, it's incredible. You know, that's uh, actually a feature that's been available in uh, Magic Lantern for a yes. number of years. That's yeah. actually how I do my uh, time lapse on my 5D Mark III. I, I don't actually honestly use my um, Magic Lantern install on my 5D that much, but when I do, it's usually for the inter intervalometer feature. It's so nice to just be able to dial in some numbers and set a time and go. Yep. I know, and Nikon's had it for a decade or, or more, and, and I always complained to them, and they always said, well, it's not about selling extra dongles and stuff. I'm like, well, then put it in there. It's just software. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. simple. I don't know why they don't do some of that stuff. Well, and, 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 now they and, are doing it. Yeah, they are doing it, finally. Uh, but, if, I mean, the other thing they said to me was that pros don't need it. I'm like, okay, pros don't need it, but those of us who buy the damn thing want it. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I'm a, I consider myself a pro. Um, uh, where's the line between pro and amateur anywhere right, these days? Right. It's, it's so gray oh. that a feature like that, I bet, if it was in there, people would pros use would it. use it. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. If, if you're like, hey, you have to use this little dial device that you plug into your camera, or you just have it in your camera, then you see the dial device, you chuck it out, and you use your camera, and you're going to just work with that because it's simpler. That's one less thing you have to worry about. Uh -huh. One less watch battery you have to dig up when it dies on you. and uh. Uh -huh. Exactly. So what else is missing from this camera that, that you and I wish was really there? I don't I know what you're, I'm thinking. You're, um, you're throwing it out there, and you caught me completely off guard. I actually <laughs> make notes for all the things I'm trying to find. The you flippy have, dippy out screen. You like, really? You, that's like what you wanted out of this? I, I I want it on every new camera. I want touch screen, and I want to be able to have a monitor in a situation where I don't need a big old fat extra monitor on the top. I mean, go back to the the new Olympus that we were talking about again in the D three E M whatever their long number is. Yeah, Mark two. It has a flippy dippy out screen. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's it, Canon says professionals don't want that, and it's and it's a point of failure. They want their bodies to not fall apart. Okay, I get it. So create a 5D Mark III. I'm sorry, a 5D flippy dippy out screen model, 
and and so pros that want it can have it. Pros that don't want it can stick with the 5D Mark III. I mean, if they're going to specialize, why not do more of the things like this? Because I I just really like being able to use the touch screen on my T4i. It's awesome. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, with the 5D Mark III, I'm kind of on Canon's side on this one, man. Ah, uh, come on. <laughs> I do like flip-out screens, and I do use it on the the GH4. But I I was shooting by the ocean earlier this year while I was in California, and I got splashed with uh, seawater while I was filming. And now my camera does some weird stuff because it has a flip-out screen. <laughs> if it didn't have a flip-out screen, I would have probably been just fine, dried it off and let it go and been okay. The 5D Mark III... Usually when I'm using that camera, I'm behind the camera. I'm not in front of it. So I don't really have a need for a flip-out screen when I'm filming. If I do get into a situation where I have to lay down on the ground or something like that, I actually have a device. It's, uh, it's made by TipLink, and I have a hack for it on my site. But uh, that TipLink device, you can program it to actually access the USB port on your camera and beam the video back to your phone. So then you can just look at your phone and check out the video and basically line up your shots and set everything up from your phone. So that's your flip-out screen right there. And the TipLink device, I believe, was $26. And yeah. you hack it, install the firmware, and you're cooking again with something I can't <laughs> think of right now. So does that work on a 5D Mark III? Yes, it does. It okay. uh, works on cool. anything that supports the a full video view of EOS Utility. Uh, so if you plug your camera into your computer and you can use the EOS utility to see the video, you can also use that to beam your video over to your phone and view it remotely. Oh, so you have to be connected to your computer. Uh, no, you don't have to be connected oh, to your okay. computer, but to find out if your camera is compatible, okay. you just need to make sure that when you plug it into the EOS utility, you can see what's on the camera screen. Uh, so, the 5D Mark III is, is good. One of the cameras that doesn't have it but still sort of works with the EOS utility is the EOS M. Uh, that one, they limited the access and controllability via the USB port. Uh, so you can't view video live while you're filming with the uh, EOS M via that hack, but it works with the 7D, the 5D Mark III, the 5D Mark II, uh, pretty much all of the new T-I cameras. So... <laughs> It's really handy, and the device is 25 bucks, 30 bucks maybe on the high side. The hacks completely um, walk through on DSLRFilmNoob.com. Just search for tip-link, and you'll find it. Um, that, cool. that unit, too, there is now a newer version of the Hackout that allows it to implement Magic Lantern overlays. So if you want to do the research and figure it out, you can basically... Download the app for your phone, plug it in, and then you'll see the audio level meters and some of the other stuff that's available from Magic Lantern on your phone screen and not just what the camera sees. So wow. that's an added bonus. Um, on the 5D Mark III, the other cool thing is that it does transmit its audio level meters to the screen. So if you're recording audio directly into the 5D Mark III, you'll see the audio level meters on your phone as well as the video layout. Wow. Wow. See, DJ, this is why I love the fact that you've started this podcast and you've invited me to be a, a periodic co-host because I'm learning all sorts of crap from you. That's man, awesome. I, I forgot I even demonstrated that hack. It's been so long <laughs> since I posted that, man. See, but, I was at the beach in California a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to do some low-angle shots with my 5D Mark III, and I ended up just putting my 5D Mark III on the sand the wet sand, which was a mistake, but nothing got damaged. But uh, I wish I had a flippy dippy out screen that time in order to make the shot that I wanted to make. Yeah, one of the other things is um, the F Canon 60 implements Wi Fi, but it only implements Wi Fi for photography and not right. for video. Correct. So if you are shooting on a, fi or a 6D, you do have that camera option thing sort of built in but you can still use the hack in order to get uh, video mode working on your phone. Uh, you do want to disable that Wi-Fi thing if you're not using it because it eats up battery. And, and I have a 6D as well as a 5D. The 6D is actually my kind of like, if I were to put a camera in the danger that you're talking about there, that would probably be the one I would grab because 
now I think I paid twelve hundred bucks for the sixty. I don't know what they're going for right now, but I, I think it's in the thousand dollar range on right. the used market. So that's a lot less expensive to replace than my five D Mark Three. One other oh. thing, I'm oh, sorry. We we haven't mentioned the fact that the batteries uh, still work, although I'm a little confused that I haven't gotten a clarification because the battery is listed as a E6N, whereas the battery for the 5D Mark III, for example, is an E6. E6. So in that video this morning, Canon, it does say that the batteries are compatible from the 5D Mark III, but I don't understand this difference with the N. I don't know what that means yet. Well, Canon changed some of their battery labeling uh, last year or the year before. It was due to some sort of manufacturing issue in Japan where it was illegal to make a certain oh, type that. of battery uh, versus whatever battery they were normally sending out. And so when they discontinued that, they added some modifiers to a few of their batteries in order to make them legal again. I don't think that applied to the original LPE-6, but I know it did apply to some of the cameras on the on the lineup. And I'm trying to remember which ones it was, but it's escaping me. I apologize. <laughs> I, I do remember that fact, though. Your and, brain um, is like mine. It doesn't always work. Yeah, no joke. Especially With all these uh, cameras and stuff, it's just virtually impossible to try to remember all this stuff. But whatever deal it was that made that illegal, uh, Canon and some of these other companies started implementing a slight name change to denote the batteries that were made with whatever issue solved in them. And that may have come out of the whole your lap starts on fire from Sony laptops problem <laughs> that was around back in 2012 and 2013. So. Right. Well, um, there are a couple of other itty-bitty little notes to make about the new Canon 5Ds, by the okay. way. Hit me up. Uh, exciting stuff, really exciting stuff, like this thing called Advanced Mirror Control. Uh, it's a user-selectable shutter release time lag that suppresses camera vibration for reaching image shake. Now, I don't know anything more than that bullet point that's in there, so uh, I, I haven't seen anything about it, but apparently they've got a new way for the mirror to flip up. Isn't that exciting? I... If you're worried about image shake, I guess that's important. Uh, and it goes back to... Uh, the other Olympus that we were talking about earlier, the fact that they've got that five-axis image stabilization on the sensor, yeah, um, which would be really awesome on a 5D body, I think. Um, you know, because I mean, it, lenses with IS in them are so much more expensive. Now, this leads me to the fact that maybe Canon will never do something like that because what are they there for? They want to sell you lenses, Money. right? Uh, so maybe they won't ever put an image stabilization on the sensor. I don't know. I'm well, just... there are some limits to that uh, uh, sensor technology, the five-axis stabilization. Part of the reason they can get away with that in the Olympus camera is because the sensor is so small. Right. When you start getting up in size and sensor, it takes a larger motor control system to actually move the sensor around, and there may it may be a physics issue where... <laughs> You can't get a large enough set of little servos to move the sensor around inside the camera body without dealing with the issues of battery draw and all the other things to move that larger sensor around. I might be wrong, but that's yeah. that kind of seems reasonable. I know right. Sony has some sort of image stabilization built into their full frame, but theirs is only three axis and not five axis, so maybe that's how they got around that. Um, it might be possible that Canon just doesn't do it forever, but uh, right. it would be nice to see smaller lenses. You know, IS is something that adds an extra, you know, 100 or 200 grams to your lens, and it, you know, now you have control switches, and you have to make sure you turn it off if you're in video mode and everything else. I mean, I've made right. the mistake of filming with an IS lens on a tripod, and I forgot because I was handheld, and then I put it on a tripod, and now I'm listening to the audio and I hear this. Uh huh. I'm like, what is going on here? What did I do? I didn't hear that, you know. And it turns out I forgot to flip off the IS switch on yep. the camera. And Canon's version of IS is not the same sort of tech as they're using 
in these guys, the servo systems are actually moving the sensor around physically in order to stabilize it based on what it's sensing as far as its physical position. The Canon implementation of IS is just a gyroscope deal. So they're just spinning a little motor around inside of your lens in order to basically give you the same effect as you'd get out of a gyroscope where that spinning momentum keeps you sort of stabilized as you move back and forth. And if you've ever played with a gyroscope as a kid, you know, you can move it around side to side and push it and stuff like that and it moves smoothly and slowly because of the rotating disc on the inside. Yep. I I, mean, I understand. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see where that technology goes and whether Canon tries to implement it. Uh, I kind of think they won't, but one last thing to cover on the new release list is lenses. Uh, Canon had the 11 to 24 f/4 lens, and it, I believe Olympus had a few announcements as well. They finally announced a release date for the Micro Four Thirds 7 to 14 millimeter f/2.8 lens, as well as a surprise 8 millimeter f/1.8 prime for Micro Four Thirds cameras. Let's start with that 11 to 24, though. What do you think about that, Mitch? It's expensive. <laughs> three thousand dollars. Three isn't it? grand, Jesus. and it's an f four as opposed to a two point eight, uh, which is what some people would like to have seen. You're the wide angle king. Uh, does does an eleven excite you? It it does. It it really does. Like I. <laughs> I've been playing around with the what is basically the equivalent of 14 millimeters on my GH4, and I love it. I've been running around shooting wide angle every which way, and I would love to go down to 11 millimeters on a full frame body. F4, you're right, is unattractive, but it's 11 millimeters. You know, right? What do you want? Right. Uh, Three thousand dollars, though, man, that's. It's got to be amazing. Yeah, that's really expensive. <laughs> and Rokinon offers up a couple of ultra-wide-angle lenses that are f3.5, I believe. They're manual focus. But if you're shooting that wide, um, you might not actually need autofocus, really. Right. I mean, right. as soon as you get to 11 millimeters, everything is, you know, not everything, <laughs> but a lot of stuff is going to be in focus. So, right. y man, I want this, but not for $3,000. Honestly, I'll probably just stick with my El Cheapo Rokinon ultra wide angle Russian technology lens that I have laying around. I believe that's a eight millimeter, uh, eight point five millimeter. I have to look it up to to find out. But yeah, at that point you're getting cool shots, but you're not getting anything for I don't know whatever you. What would you use that for? for your kids. Like, if you were taking pictures, would you really want to show them, like, with their kind of, like, pointy head all stretched out and everything <laughs> from the distortion that's created by 11 millimeters? But no. if you're shooting, like, skateboard stuff, you know, what is more awesome than laying on the ground and having somebody ollie over the top of you and getting the picture of the sun flare over their shoulder and seeing the entire skate park and getting that beautiful shot? Or... If you just look on my one of my latest posts, I posted something from the uh, 7 to uh, 14 millimeter f4 lens for my GH4. I had a sun uh, sunset at the airport in Seattle uh, from the window, and because the the angle of the lens is so wide, you don't really have that weird reflection effect that you'd normally get out of of windows. So you don't need a pol polarizer filter to get through that. And it's beautiful. Like the sun is setting over the horizon. Then I've got that right in the center. And then the entire thing that's going on around it, the airplanes landing, people moving stuff around, all that is all surrounded in this beautiful pose. And those kinds of shots are the, that's, that's what I live for with a, a wide angle lens like that. It's really, really cool. Right. It's specialized and you're not going to want to use it for everything, but man, if they could make this 11 to 24 $1,000 or even like 1800 it would probably be back on my radar. $3,000, I might as well buy another camera body. Well, the, the thing that they're highlighting the most in the press release 
is uh, this lens is ideal for professionals, I'll just read it, who want the ultimate in creative Im image expression with sharp, crisp detail, whether shooting entire buildings from a close position, blah, blah, I'm skipping ahead. Cinematographers will be equally impressed with the lens's ability to retain straight lines. Oh, wow. So they're, they're talking a lot about minimal distortion through the entire zoom range. So that's, that's probably why they're getting the three grand out of it. I wonder what kind of image trickery they're doing in order to accomplish that. To maintain straight lines at uh, at 11 millimeters yeah. is pretty crazy. That's, I don't know how. That's I don't what know, marketing I, here? Yeah, I don't know how they would how they would do that. I'm looking on um, Amazon right now because I wanted to know. I don't have my bag next to me to dig in and find out what the uh, what that fisheye is, but it's um, Rokinon makes it. It's a 12 mil, 12 millimeter f2.8 ultra wide lens, and it's compatible with full frame cameras. They run about 400 to 500 dollars in the new to used market, and that's not 11, but it's 12. So <laughs> I mean, that's still yeah. pretty dang wide. Yeah. And 500 bucks versus 3,000 dollars. Yeah, but I'll bet that one focus. shows a lot of curvy lines. Oh yeah, that's that's all it does is curve. <laughs> so and we're going to have direction. to see. I mean, obviously, for people like architectural photographers, maybe who really like to shoot yeah. stuff and they they don't want the curvy lines, this could be very important. Now uh, so uh, the other probably not so. The other wide angle lenses I mentioned, the seven to fourteen millimeter f two eight from Olympus, uh, that's using Olympus's Pro lens technology, which basically means it's like a 5D Mark III where it's water resistant, dust resistant, and all that stuff. They build their lenses a little bit beefier than the Panasonic offerings. That's another ultra wide. So at 7 to 14, that's giving you roughly a 14 to 28 millimeter equivalent. I know you're not a micro four thirds shooter. You're also right. not a fan of wide angle lenses. So <laughs> can't even well, throw you that question. I but, love them. I, I think they're really great. I just don't I t what I tend to shoot tends to be more faces and people and stuff than wide landscapes. Well, there's some really cool um, portrait applications for wide angle as well, though. You can always get that strange, bizarre, like somebody sitting on a park bench and they kind of curve around the image and they're, hold and they're holding a book or something like that and the book is the only thing that's not distorted. So okay, you, you send me one and I'll practice. <laughs> I'll, I will start <laughs> hunting down a guide. Actually, if there's not a guide, I probably shouldn't make one. Yes. But, uh, yeah, that's, I use that on a regular basis. Also, if you have pets, there's nothing cooler. Well, there's probably something cooler. but <laughs> There's a the very cool pet shot to get is to have the ultra-wide angle lens you know, um, in the case of the 7 to 14, the focal range is 10 centimeters, so roughly like 9 inches, 10 inches. You can have your, your pet this close to the camera and take the picture, and it's just their nose expanded out completely, and then the entire surrounding is dropping away as though it's a, a million miles away. It's kind of that um, weird-looking perspective that you got out of uh, children children vision views in some of the cartoons like if you ever watch road rats yeah where they do that like perspective from their view where everything else is like bending out and then just the stuff in front looks normal well uh -huh. that sort of shot is also really cool for not for everybody's face because if you have a really long nose <laughs> or some other predominant feature it can be somewhat hideous but getting the super close up of someone's face especially if there's some crazy action going on around them can really make it a, a neat field of view as well. Um, if you're at a concert or if you're at some event where there's a lot of people, especially like a mosh pit, I took a great shot a few years ago at a Bad Religion concert. I was on stage and the shot's down into the mosh pit and the guy is on top of the crowd, crowd surfing and just about to fall into the mosh pit and he's flipped over onto his stomach and he's looking up into the camera. So I got the wide angle of his face and then I got all of the crowd surrounding him looking, you know, vicious and mean and everything and the shot's pretty cool. Ah. So there are a lot of ways that you can use your wide angle lens to get that beautiful shot. Okay, I'll go buy one. 
You've convinced me. Do you not have the 16 to 35 in your collection? No. Really? Oh, man. <laughs> I, I think it's like, if you don't buy anything else with a, a Canon owner, the four lenses that I think I, I feel like everybody should own, you should have their full range of zooms, which is their 16 to 35, their 24 to 70, and their 70 to 200. IS or whatever, if you want to go that route, that's fine, but get those three lenses, and that covers you for pretty much everything that you would normally want to shoot. Then get a 50 millimeter f1.4 or f1.2 if you have the budget, and now you have the prime for the super shallow depth of field. So you have now basically covered the full range of portrait to you know action stuff all the way down to wide angle stuff, and you have four lenses to carry around. Now those are the biggest lenses that Canon sells, so you're going to have a bit of weight to carry around with you. But if you ever watch um, somebody who's doing photojournalism running around at an event, he usually has at least two cameras strapped to him, and one of them has a 70 to 200 on him, and the other one has a 24 to 70. And then he usually has a wide-angle lens shoved in his pocket somewhere just in case things get sideways and he really wants to get something crazy. So right. that's that's my kind of theory on all of this. I might be wrong, and you know, I'm sure there are other applications, a lot of other applications, that those lenses don't necessarily fit the bill for. But for me, personally, and for a lot of people I know, if you have those, you're three-quarters to 90% of the way to whatever you want to shoot. There are obvious exceptions, like if you want to shoot birds or something like that, you're going to want to get like a teleconverter for your 70 to 200. Right. And, and, if you and then when you double it now you're getting 400 out of that and you get the reach that you were you were wishing for earlier or you grab a crop sensor body and slap it on there and now you have the reach that you were looking for either way those lenses are awesome i don't know Mitch since we're kind of on a sidetrack about lenses what's in your kit man i have uh the 70 to 200 is version 2 which i we mentioned last Ooh, you week. You the fancy one. Yeah, I spent the big bucks. Um, then I have the 24 to 105, which came with my 5D Mark II when I purchased that body many, many years ago. Good golly, that was six years ago. Wow. I have the 85 1.8. Uh, I always wish I had the 1.2 because it's a much sexier lens. Um, I have a couple of lens babies, which I use for special effects every now and then. And the only other one that I have is the 40 millimeter pancake, which I tend to shoot a lot down in my studio downstairs when I'm making my own, one of my videos for YouTube. Wow. I, I would have thought you'd had a, a crazier collection than that, Mitch. I've I've tended to just shoot what I got, and uh, I'm sorry I may be disappointing some people. Okay, uh, but I, I've never been a lens fanatic like many people like you are. Yeah, I carry. I have one kit that's just primes, and then I have one kit that's just zooms. And my prime kit is the 24-14, 35-14, 51-2, and the 85-18. I did have the 1-2 the 8512 but I didn't like it. It's too too freaking big and it's fly by wire and the element if you've ever shot on that the element comes right up to the edge of the mount. So right. it's so close that I almost scratched it a few times just putting it onto my camera and after that I was like, "You know what? I don't want this around cuz I'm just going to break it. It's not that durable." And then I had the original model, the version 1, and the autofocus on that was awful. Yeah. And from from what I've heard on the version 2, they haven't fixed that much either. Moving that much glass around, it's just slow and clunky. And then going up the line, I have the 135 f2, which I love that lens. That is a very affordable prime lens. If you want to do some kind of like, I don't know, Sort of from a distance portraits or street photography, the 35 or 135 f2, it's like a $700 prime lens or prime lens, and it's an L series. It's really sharp. It looks beautiful. F2 at 135 means that you're gonna have uh, great bokeh. Everything's gonna look beautiful and out of focus behind it. 
And especially if you're doing like wedding photography or something like that, you can really run around behind the crowd at 135 and, and get really excellent shots. And then I'm trying to think what else. Oh, and I have a bunch of random stuff. I have the uh, Sigma 30 millimeter f1.4 for my crops. I have a couple of um, of well, I have the Tokina 11 to 16. That's a zoom. And then my zoom bag. I have the zooms I mentioned. And then I have the 24 to 105 that I hand out to people when they're filming. Uh, my lens collection is crazy. It's though. insane. Yeah, I yeah, get I, it. I own most of Canon's L series lenses, and then I own some of their primes that aren't L series. Like I have the 51.4. I carry. I have a bag for the 6D, and the 6D bag is the 24 to 105, the 51.4. And a 17 to 35 millimeter f2.8, which is the old, old wide angle, and those are that's my kind of travel one because all those are a little bit lighter than my my big stuff, and I kind of I have all these shelves behind me here. I see they're completely filled with lenses and other crap. And when I have a job that comes up, I basically just it's kind of like shopping. You okay? I, I'm gonna be shooting this. So I'm gonna need one of these. I'm gonna be shooting this. So I need one of these. I need one of these. And then you fill up. I limit myself to two camera bags because for a while, when my collection got huge, I got into this bad habit of thinking that I needed everything I owned at a shoot. And then you, so you carried all of this crap with you. You get there, and then you end up only needing a zoom, maybe a prime, and some audio gear. And I carried all my, you know, I hoofed all my lenses out to this location, and then I didn't need half of them. And it was a bad choice, and it hurt my back, and I had to have an assistant to help me, and it was awful. And it's and it's a risk of theft, too. Oh, yeah, there's like 20 grand sitting in those yeah, bags. I mean, right. all it would take is someone to run up and grab it and run off. That's yeah. what, one of the things I really like about the GH4 body is that because the lenses are so small and the camera itself and the whole system is so tiny, I can pack every single one of my zooms and every single one of my primes into a single small bag, and I don't even have to think about compromising on like which lenses to bring or which ones not to bring. It's just like, ah, throw everything in there. I'll use whatever I use. Don't worry about it. Let's go. Right. And so I'm... It's kind of bad because it's got me back into the habit again of just like packing the kitchen sink. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, it's kind of nice that you can pack the kitchen sink and you only have a 15-pound camera bag instead of a 25 or 30-pound camera bag. Well, let me ask you, since we're way over the time limit, oh, yeah, shoot. but we're we're <laughs> but we're we're here, and since this is our first video one, if people happen to be watching this on video, and if you're watching listening on audio, tough. Uh, what kind of a room are you in? Is that an? I mean, it's it looks pretty massive. Um, I have a, I believe it's three thousand square foot studio. So I am lifting the mic up, or the camera up into the air right now for you to see. There's the front of the building. So All it's, it's that, not part of your house. Uh, okay. So and then there's some studio yeah. stuff. If you see that wall back there, there's another studio yeah. set behind that. I've and seen that then, on some of your videos, yeah. Yeah, and there's a there's three sets in this area, so it's pretty massive. Um, I live in a condo, but I bought the entire building. Ah. So I live upstairs, and then I have a 3,000-square-foot downstairs area, or, or 2,800, something like that, to do all of my video and photo work. See, that's then, awesome. I have a basement underneath of this, and that's where I keep my lasers, my CNC machines, and some of the stuff that's a little bit messier. And then if you look around here, there's a 3D printer right there. Uh, there's a 3D printer behind me. I have up right now that if you can see that gray screen back there, yeah, that's one of those uh, reflex um, color light screens that I've been testing out. I haven't got a chance to post anything on that yet, but uh, somebody hated theirs and gave it to me for 200 bucks, and they're normally like 12 or $1,400. And then also behind me is, um, well, actually... Exercise machine. And... Yeah, there's an exercise machine for my <laughs> wife when she's, like, running in the morning. I've got keyboards behind me there. Um, looking down here, this is the sampler I use to cue all the music for the show, which I've done horribly with this time, so sorry about that, guys. And then there's uh, 
there's some studio gear. I do like audio recording and stuff. So I have a keyboard next to me. I have a couple of keyboards behind me. Underneath those tarps over there, uh, if I'm pointing it, yep, right there. Uh, you can see that leopard print. There's two Jupiter keyboards back there, the uh, ultra old school analog keyboards. So I have a lot of junk. You got a lot of stuff. I'm a hoarder. I used to and run drums. a recording studio when I was younger, and when the record when I closed down the recording studio, I liquidated my major stuff like my reel to reel 24 track recorder and and my big boards and everything. And then I kept a lot of my classic keyboards and guitars and amps and stuff like that. So I've been carrying those around. I don't really tour with the band or play anymore, but I do jingles on occasion or I do soundtracks for people. So Having all that here, I can hop over basically to this uh, digital trap set right behind me, drum out something, record it on my 24-track recorder here, and then sample stuff on the sampler and lay down guitar tracks and keyboards and everything and get it all sorted out. The uh, jingle that you guys hear for the show, uh, both of those, that's me playing. So there you go. It's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for the tour, DJ. That was awesome. Uh, no problem. Um, Here's my I, tour. There's my cabinets there, and I got some cabinets there, and then I got a basement downstairs. Big deal. <laughs> yeah, but you've got some nice, nice wood stuff there. I don't have any wood. This is all just painted white. So, I don't know. Basically, the trick here is um, I moved from the Denver metropolitan area out to like the middle of nowhere, and in the middle of nowhere, you can buy an entire building. So if you can sustain yourself on video production by traveling remotely, uh, then you can afford to move to a place like this for really cheap, and then you have no overhead for your living expenses. Right. And having your place completely paid for means that you can be completely more flexible about owning a giant bag of, say, Canon L-Series lenses, for example. <laughs> It's awesome, and and there are so many things in that uh, facility you've got there that we would make entire shows out of. We could talk about. I mean, oh, we, you, you ask about bags. I mean, we we ought to do a whole show on uh, what camera bags you're using. Oh shoot, I've got an evolution series of bags, man. I what? Bet. When we when we go video full time, we'll start doing something like that. I think that's a great idea, Mitch. Um, yeah. Maybe like storytelling time. Like here's here's my Tamrac bag that I really love, and here's yeah. this Gorilla bag that I use for light bulbs and stuff like that. Um, exactly. On that note, we are an hour twenty three, so I think it is about time to close up shop. Say Mitch, goodbye. what is your pick of the week? Ah, uh, you know I I apologize. I didn't plan. Uh, slap me around. That's okay. This show is kind of haphazardly put together, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait! Somebody sent in a question. What? Yes. We have a question. I, I've I've been watching for the questions. Patrick asks, should I buy the GH4 now or hold out to see if Canon finally comes out with a 4K camera in a similar price range by NAB? Uh, I don't think that Canon. My answer is that Canon's not going to come out with a 4K camera in a similar price range to the GH4. So buy the GH4. Yeah, you're not going to see Canon releasing any 4K stuff anytime in the near future, especially with the release dates being almost, what, six months out, seven months out for the S-series cameras. So no uh, no 4K from Canon. Uh, well, the GH4, well, no 4K in their DSLRs from Canon. Well, I, I believe the 4K, the 5D Mark IV will be 4K. Yeah, but that won't be announced until what? Next year, probably. No, they're talking. Uh, my sources are talking this summer. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, announced this summer. there will be new, like C three hundred, maybe at NAB, maybe uh, a couple of new video cameras because they tend to always just you know do video cameras there as well. But people are telling me that the five D Mark IV may be as early as summer. Oh wow. Well, if that's the case, um, I suppose it depends on the price. If your yeah, budget it's is not going to be cheap, it's not. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be anywhere close to the GH4. I'm guessing the if the three thousand six hundred dollar price tag on the 5DS is any uh, prerequisite, uh -huh. that's we're going to be looking at the four thousand dollar range. Yeah. And exactly. you remember the price difference between the 1DC and the 1DX? 
I, yeah. you know, one of them was twelve thousand, and the other one was, you know, six thousand. So they really well, put know, a premium. On you that. know, they just lowered the price on the one DC to. Yeah, it's grand. down to eight grand. Yeah. Woohoo! But that's still very <laughs> spendy for a single body. Yeah. Um, the GH4 though, guys, that is. That is on sale right now in a lot of places. If you don't mind buying gray market from Japan or from these other areas, you can get it as low as twelve hundred bucks. And used, you can get it down to about a thousand dollars. So if you're not invested in Canon glass and you're not invested in one camera format and you're just looking to move into 4K, I really love my GH4. I didn't think I would. I thought I would hate it, but um, you know what? It's grown on me, and now I use it continuously alongside my 5D Mark III, so there you go. And and I'm going to have to apologize because we're, we're, we finally get a couple of questions popping in. Kate wants to know, as follow a question, do you think the A7S will have a Mark II with internal 4K at NAB? Uh, I don't think at NAB, but I do think there will be a Mark II of the A7S coming out. And 4K may be in the cards, but Sony is still trying to protect their higher-end cameras. So they've been um, obviously leaving out internal 4K recording on those cameras and only allowing external 4K recording. We might still see uh, external recording of 4K on an A7S Mark II when it's finally released. It just came out last year, so right. I don't know that they'll turn it around quite that fast. The A7, how long did that take for the Mark II to come out? About two years? Yeah. So probably next year yeah. uh, and this is all pure speculation guys because uh, I don't have any secret information from Sony that's going to tell me for sure but the either. A7S is doing so well and they don't want to hurt their 4K recording higher end video cameras so they're kind of they've even been limiting their lower models the A or FS700 and FS100 were not allowed to have 4K internal recording because they had a camera above those that recorded 4K, and they were capable of doing so. The A7S, if you look at the sensor that they're using as well as the technology and the controller chip for it, they're basically using the same thing as their 4K consumer video camera for the chipset controller, and the only thing different is that the consumer-grade video camera has a 20-megapixel sensor, and the A7S has an 8.8-megapixel sensor. So there isn't any reason at all why that processor can't handle 4K internal recording. They claim heat and some of these other nonsense things, but are you going to tell me that a a tube-shaped handy cam has more heat capability of dispersion than a freaking metal body DSLR? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. I think that's just Sony giving us the bad <laughs> end of the stick there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, for those of you, I love having those questions. Uh, if, if you are watching this recorded, by the way, or watching the live stream right now. When DJ posts this on DSLR Film Noob, let us know whether you like the live version and being able to ask questions. Give us some feedback on what you think we should be doing with the show. Yeah, this is still kind of experimental, so yeah. there you go. Um, if you don't like it, tell us. If you, if you really think it's cool to be able to ask questions while the show's being recorded or watch us goofy guys... Let us know. See me flail my arms around. Um, <laughs> my pick of the week, though, and I'm going to throw this out real quick, is the Minolta 50mm f1.4. Since we were talking about Sony a7s, uh, I have the LA-EA4 adapter, which is an E-mount-to-A-mount adapter, and the Minolta lenses are all A-mount uh, lenses. So you can buy the 50mm f1.4 from Minolta on Amazon for 150 and on eBay for about 140 and that's an f1.4 prime 50 millimeter lens. It looks pretty good. It works well with autofocus. It's a little bit soft in the corners, and it has a little bit of, of darkening areas on the corners, but it looks as good as the 50 millimeter f1.4 from Canon, and it's only 150 bucks. So it's a freaking bargain if you're an a7s shooter and you're looking for autofocus for say, photography or something like that. So definitely check out the Minolta glass. The 50mm f1.4 is pretty sweet. Awesome. 
All right, on that note, thanks for watching, listening, whatever you ingested this with to another episode of DSR Film New Podcast. And thanks, Mitch, for joining me. People, where can you find Mitch on the internet? Some place called planet5d.com or planetmitch.com. And I'm always available on dslrfilmnoob.com. <laughs> and fade out. Awesome. Good. Sorry we went long there, Mitch. No, that's fine. You know, I love to talk. That's good, <laughs> good stuff. And like I said, I love learning. Uh, we're still broadcasting, by the way. I guess I should. Oh, are we? Oh, we're uh, we're on the secret back end of this now. We're done recording the podcast. So, well, we have a whopping three viewers, and one of them's me right now. So everybody yeah. stopped tuning out. So I'm gonna I don't, turn this off. Yeah, I don't know. I.